Welcome to AP Microeconomics Unit 1. This unit covers the basic foundational concepts in microeconomics, meaning it will be a lot of key terms to memorize. This unit is worth 12-15% to of your AP exam in May. You need to know the things in this unit to understand future units. This video is simply a clip together video of all of my topic review videos of Unit 1 without the questions at the end. If you want to try your hand at some AP style questions, check out the Unit 1 playlist. Enough of me babbling though, let's get in to Unit 1. Topic 1.1 is all about the concept of scarcity in economics. So to start off, resources are defined in economics as inputs used to produce goods and services that satisfy humans' wants and needs. These resources are typically split into four groups, land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. Scarcity exists because these resources are limited, while human wants and desires are virtually unlimited. Scarcity can be caused by a simple limited availability of resources or by simply not enough time for labor by humans to be performed in a single day. Scarcity is the fundamental economic problem that drives all decision making. Because resources are scarce, societies must make economic trade-offs. This means to obtain one thing, we must give up something else. Like if a government wanted to allocate more resources to healthcare, it would have to cut back spending in another place like education to do such a thing. Many factors in economics are scarce, such as land, as there is only so much land in the world. Labor is also scarce because there is a limited number of people available with specific skills. And same with capital, as there is only a finite amount of money in the world. The only thing that is said to not be scarce is established knowledge. Once knowledge is created, it can be shared and used by multiple people simultaneously without being diminished. This characteristic makes knowledge a non-rival good, meaning one person's use of it does not reduce its availability to others. Office 1.2 is all about resource allocation in economics. So if you remember back to last video, we were talking on scarcity in economics. Well, the idea here is that since scarcity is fundamental to any economic system, resource allocation must occur. Resource allocation involves answering three basic questions. What goods and services to produce? How to produce those goods and services? And who consumes the goods and services? In a command economy, the government determines what to produce and how to produce it. And who receives the final products. This system can lead to efficient allocations in certain areas, but often lacks the flexibility and responsiveness of other systems. In a market economy, resources are allocated based on market prices, which reflect the preferences and behaviors of consumers and producers. This system encourages efficiency and innovation, but it can also lead to inequalities if left unchecked. And finally, in a mixed economy, certain sectors may be controlled by the government, like healthcare or education, while others operate under market principles, and this would be the way of the United States. This blend allows for government intervention in areas where the market may fail to provide for public needs. Each system involves a particular set of institutional arrangements and a coordinating mechanism for allocating scarce resources and distributing output. Topic 1.3 is all about production possibility curves in economics. So as you can see here, we have a graph. The graph shows me trying my hardest, showing the amount of paper airplanes I can make in a minute, being 10, and the amount of paper cranes I can make in a minute. 5. The line you see on the graph creates a production possibility curve. This curve is used to show the trade-offs associated with allocating resources. So if I wanted to make 8 paper airplanes in a minute, the trade-off would be not making 4 paper cranes. Any production made below the curve, like 2 paper airplanes and 1 paper crane, would be inefficient. Anything on the line is efficient, and anything outside the curve is virtually unattainable because of scarcity. This leads into the idea of opportunity cost. Opportunity cost simply means what you sacrifice. I sacrifice the ability to make 10 paper airplanes if I decide to produce 5 paper cranes, therefore making 10 paper airplanes my opportunity cost. The thing is though, perfect straight lines like this one aren't all that common and only happen when opportunity costs are constant, and this is because over time, things might take longer to do. And the fact is that humans are perfect. This means you might have curves that look like this but you can still calculate opportunity costs, though it may be harder, like in this scenario. The opportunity cost of making 40 manufactured goods is 40 agricultural goods, because that is the potential that is being sacrificed. The fact is that the shape of the curve depends on whether opportunity costs are constant, increasing, or decreasing. Anything outside the curve is said to be unattainable, but if new production methods or technologies got added that were faster, it would result in the curve expanding into potential new areas. Economic growth also results in an outward shift of the PPC. Topic 1.4 is all about different advantages in trade. So let's start with defining two terms, absolute and comparative advantage. Absolute advantage occurs when an individual, business, or country can produce more of a good or service than another producer using the same amount of resources. So if country A can produce 100 cars using the same resources that country B uses to produce 80 cars, country A has an absolute advantage in car production. 
Comparative advantage refers to the ability to produce a good or service at a lower opportunity cost than another producer. This is more important in determining the benefits of trade rather than absolute advantage. Even if country A is better at producing both cars and computers, if it has a lower opportunity cost for producing cars than computers compared to country B, it should specialize in cars. Meanwhile, country B should specialize in computers, even if it is less efficient, because its opportunity cost for producing computers is lower. Specializing in the production of goods where you have a comparative advantage allows for efficient resource use and opens up the possibility for trade. This enables countries or individuals to consume beyond their production possibility curve, or PPC. For trade to be beneficial, the terms of trade, or the rate at which one good is exchanged for another, must reflect the comparative advantages of the trading parties. By doing so, both can enjoy more of both goods than they could if they try to produce everything themselves. Topic 1.5 is all about the concept of cost-benefit analysis and economics. So let's start with the definition. Cost-benefit analysis means that when making decisions, people or firms assess what they gain, benefits, versus what they lose, costs, to determine if a choice is worth pursuing. As a review, opportunity cost is the value of the next best alternative that is given up when making a choice. Whenever we make a decision, there's always a trade-off because of scarcity. You are required to know for your exam how to calculate opportunity cost, and for that, you should go check out my 1.3 video. Rational agents consider both explicit costs, which are direct costs like money, and implicit costs, which are indirect costs like time, when calculating total economic costs. Utility is the satisfaction or happiness a consumer gets from consuming goods or services. Total revenue refers to the income a firm receives from selling its product. Total benefits are measured as utility for consumers and total revenue for firms. Rational decisions are made by comparing the total benefits, or what you gain, to the total costs, or what you lose. This can be illustrated using a table or graph to show the relationship between benefits and costs. You can calculate total benefits by adding up all the positive gains from a decision. Similarly, total costs include all expenses or sacrifices. For instance, if starting a business brings in $500 in revenue, but costs $300 in expenses, the net benefit is $200. The optimal choice is where the difference between what you gain and what you lose is the greatest. Marginal benefit is the additional benefit or satisfaction gained from consuming or producing one more unit of a good or service. The marginal cost is the additional cost caused by this benefit. Some decisions allow rational agents to focus on just marginal benefits and costs. That is all. 1.6 covers marginal analysis and consumer choice, focusing on how rational consumers make decisions by comparing marginal benefits and marginal costs. To start off, you need to understand the concept of rational consumers. They're said to make decisions on how much of an activity or good to pursue based on an additional benefit, marginal benefit, compared to the additional cost, marginal cost. This leads us into the consumer choice theory, which revolves around three ideas. Consumers are rational and aim to maximize their satisfaction or utility. Consumers face constraints, such as limited income or budget. And number three, consumers use marginal analysis, which is comparing marginal benefits and marginal costs, to make sure it's the optimal decision. Constraints refer to limited resources, such as time, money, or availability of goods. Rational consumers try to make the best possible choice within these constraints. Total utility refers to the overall satisfaction a consumer gets from all the goods and services they consume. This is measured numerically in utils. Rational consumers aim to get the most satisfaction possible given their constraints. Diminishing marginal utility means that as a consumer consumes more of a good, the additional satisfaction they get from each extra unit decreases. Rational consumers distribute their spending in such a way that their marginal utility per dollar spent on each good is equal. The best way I think I can describe this is by using a table. Say we go to McDonald's every day for a week and spend $10 each time. For each day, the satisfaction level, measured in utils, will go down. Now you calculate the marginal utility, or satisfaction, per dollar by doing the marginal utility divided by the price for each one. And then say we have another scenario where we go to Burger King every day for a week and spend $10, and we quantify everything here. Now say we only have $60 to spend, and it was asking us to use marginal analysis to calculate the combination of the amount of times I should do both things. The way to do this is to keep picking whichever one has the highest marginal utility per dollar until you reach the dollar amount, which in this case is $60. And it's that simple. Thank you so much for watching! Make sure to check the description for some more help, and I will see you in Unit 2.